Where are you? What are you doing in the universe? What is happening around you? Way out here, in the far reaches of our Milky Way? Among the asteroids and comets? At the planets next door? On the surface of the sun? Or right here at home? 24,000 miles above us in geo, geosynchronous orbit? Or 250 miles in Leo, low Earth orbit? We look up to see brave and bold machines our science is sending to other worlds. And closer to Earth, thousands of objects of our own making. Many of them are ours. Increasingly, they are somebody else's. They include one that captures the ancient light of distant galaxies, one we inhabit, others that reveal what our world really looks like on a planetary scale, and hundreds of thousands of pieces of space junk. Today, what happens in space has changed everything about how we live and what we do. Most of us don't realize how heavily we depend on, on those satellites just for our day-to-day -day business. Your ATM doesn't work, your phone stopped working, uh, your television signal no longer comes in. Uh, there are a number of things in our economy and your everyday life that would stop if things in space didn't work. If suddenly, you know, we were to lose those, our, our lives would be very different. So what we're trying to do is just to make sure we know where everything is that's out there. Haleakala, the ancient place where Hawaiians call the sun, is the perfect vantage point from which to scan the sky for natural and man-made objects. Haleakala is 10,000 feet high in the middle of the ocean. It's way above all the uh, atmospheric uh, troubles, you know, turbulence and the weather, and it's, it's a way far away from the very strong city lights, and so it's a great place for looking up into the sky at nighttime. It is also the best place on Earth for atmospheric seeing during the day. Daylight imaging is very important because we need a capability to image satellites during the daytime when they're active and then when they're lit by the sun. The Maui Space Surveillance Site on the summit of Haleakala has a suite of some of the world's most sophisticated and technologically advanced telescopes shared and operated by the Air Force Research Laboratory, the Air Force Space Command, and the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy. Some of these instruments, like PanStars, the largest digital camera on Earth, survey the night sky faster and more accurately from the ground than any other instrument yet invented. It takes images of deep space, hunts Earth-threatening asteroids, and looks at satellites in geo. It's truly a wonder, and uh, the University of Hawaii is doing wonderful things with it in terms of finding things seeing things that nobody's ever seen before, certainly from the ground. Instruments like the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope are being built to enable astronomers to study aspects of the sun that no one has ever seen. Never before have we had this big a jump in our ability to see the sun and to see the environment of the sun. The last time that mankind uh, was able to make such a jump was at the time of Galileo. The Air Force telescopes, such as EOS, the largest and most versatile telescope in the Department of Defense, track satellites, spaceships like the former shuttle, the Hubble, the International Space Station, and ever-increasing amounts of new material arriving in space. Yeah, there's probably uh, about a thousand satellites that are operational that we keep track of. Uh, there are uh, thousands more that are no longer operational and then there are just hundreds of thousands of pieces of debris and junk that have fallen off the satellites. A lot of debris and as debris bumps into other debris just like in the asteroid belt there's all now you have more. It is a danger you get something traveling at 22,000 miles an hour even if it's very small it can do a lot of damage. If you think about it you can have an object the size of a bolt that could um, really damage a satellite. And even if it's large, it's large in the middle of, you know, this vast plane of emptiness. But every once in a while, you know, you get things that come close enough to hit each other. Fairly recently, uh, within the last couple of years, a, a defunct uh, Russian satellite ran into one of our communication satellites. The two smashed up and created thousands of pieces of debris that spread over the orbits that they were in. And have created uh, problems since in terms of other satellites needing to make sure they don't run into them. We have so many objects up there that things are going to bump into each other and it can be very expensive when some of these satellites cost billions of dollars. It can definitely happen again. Especially if somebody decides to blow one up on purpose.
Several years ago, the Chinese wanted to demonstrate that they had the capability of taking assets away from us. And so they attacked one of their own satellites. Uh, they had a, a weather satellite that was no longer being used, and they launched a rocket from, from China and uh, smashed it into that satellite and blew it up into lots of little pieces. So unfortunately, they did it in a way that contributed an additional probably 20,000 new pieces of space junk. Space is not only getting crowded, it's getting contested. It, it used to be the United States had space basically all to itself. But now lots of countries are putting satellites in space. Uh, they all want the, the same place to be in, in order to use the, 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 the territory in space. Uh, so it's becoming contested, as, as you might expect. Any land that everybody wants uh, is going to be contested. Well, many people do predict that our next war will be fought in space. It's going to be a long, long time before you have somebody in their armored spacesuit floating around the Earth you know, with a cannon in their hand. If there are conflicts, there are things that one nation could do to another nation to, um, to limit the capabilities of that nation. You know, we have a lot of important American assets in space, and we need to be able to, to monitor those and make sure that they're not in jeopardy. The expression here on Earth is what you don't know can't hurt you. But out here in space, what you don't know can, and if we are not forever vigilant, will hurt you. We know, for example, that it's not a question of if an asteroid will hit the Earth, but when it happens. Well, certainly PANSTARS can detect the next killer asteroid. Killer meaning, uh, at least one, one definition could be that it's, it has planet-wide impact. Uh, but you can have much smaller objects that can devastate local areas pretty dramatically. In 1908, a 50-meter asteroid exploded in the atmosphere above Tunguska, Russia, with a force of 1,000 Hiroshima bombs destroying more than 830 square miles of forest. We have already identified 5,000 potentially hazardous objects in space that are at least 100 meters in size. And we know that there are at least 15,000 more yet to be discovered. We also know that the odds are one in a thousand that something large enough to wipe out a city will hit within the next 100 years. The important thing is to discover them early so that you may have a chance to do something about it. There may be two areas in astronomy where uh, mankind is directly affected by what we're doing and learning in astronomy. One of them has to do with understanding the near space environment and asteroids and things that may collide with the Earth. And the other is understanding the connection of the Sun to the Earth. And now, with the advent of the ATST, the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope in the House of the Sun, we can begin to unlock the mysteries of our local star. In 2003, Right around Halloween, there was a major solar uh, storm. It's called a, a flare. And that, that flare lasted for just a few seconds. The energy, the flux, or the luminosity of x-rays, we say, went up by a thousand times. Um, had there been any, any human life in space, uh, it, it wouldn't be alive for long. We lost two satellites. Um, billion-dollar communication satellites that were unable to handle the sudden rise in energy that was coming at them from, from space. We lost power over sections of, of the a Swedish power grid up, up in the far north. The effect on radio communication was, was enormous. Planes over the polar regions were rerouted because of the inability to communicate, but also because of the radiation. The understanding or the ability to predict when something like this will happen is really critical to making these systems work. Making sense of the 45,000 images coming to the ATST daily from the sun, or crunching terabytes of data to post-process images of man-made objects in space, will require the services of the Maui High Performance Computing Center, which is connected via fiber optic cable with the instruments at the summit. Tools like the supercomputer are a big part of, of uh, the work that we do. Even with the best computers and telescopes, there is one thing that the astronomers and scientists on Haleakala have in common. Objects in space are often impossible to see, hard to find, and difficult to image. Most of what we're after is we're looking for needles in a haystack. 
Yeah, space is hard because you're looking at things that are a long way away. And so, um, you know, the light levels are really low. And then they have to go through a significant amount of air and atmosphere. So here you have these really small objects up there. And, you know, you don't have the capability to, to you know, look at them and, and get an image of them so you know exactly what they are. So we have to try to use additional techniques. Well, one of the things that we use is adaptive optics to correct for the atmosphere. This is a real-time correction. Adaptive optics requires you measuring the atmosphere at that moment. So you scan the laser across the sky following the satellite, using it to correct the atmosphere so you can take a picture of the satellite as it goes overhead. It's pretty impressive what, what you can do with, um, with adaptive optics in real time and then post-processing. Uh, you can extract some details that when you look at the raw image you think, there's no way they can, they can get that much information. It's making something visible that wasn't visible before. And today, because of this extraordinary working partnership between the Institute for Astronomy and the Air Force Research Laboratory, Haleakala now represents the summit of space situational awareness. We can image better, we know what's going on around us much better, and, um, and I've been pleased to have at least a small role in, in seeing that develop over the years. You love it? I love it. Absolutely love it. And, I, and it couldn't be a better location. It's Maui. Ihale akala <laughs>